things of this nature are not going to be detectable easily, even with full blown bulletproof testing in places like the UFC. So when it comes to this, what could Logan be doing? You know, the most logical thing obviously would be What's up guys, Derek from ourplatesmerdates.com. Today we're going to be doing a analysis of Logan Paul. He has an upcoming fight with uh, Floyd Mayweather and there's a lot of speculation based on his physique looking cranked as fucking hell if this guy is indeed on the Sazul or not. Seven days until I beat Floyd Mayweather. So fight should be uh, tomorrow if I'm getting this video up in time. But if you go through his... Uh, most recent pictures, you can see some pretty uh, insane physique shots. The guy looks uh, cut up while simultaneously holding a lot of mass. Like this guy looks like a fucking borderline men's physique competitor. Like he looks like if he cut another, you know, couple percent body fat, the guy could be, you know, striking distance and stepping on stage. So anyways, we're going to be getting through uh, his progression because obviously, you know, lighting, pump, all that kind of shit plays a big role. Um, at the end of the day, we can see here him uh, in training. This is his backyard. I guess this is his backyard doing like a sparring session. Um, agile as fuck, bro. Look at that. So anyways, obviously in different lighting, he looks a lot more normal than when he is here under the perfect down lighting with, you know, a pump or whatever it is. Um, and fucking, you know, perfectly sculpted out of goddamn marble. Um, here he is doing a little, uh, little run in the morning. And uh, with a back that looks, you know, reasonably natural. Here he is from the front in just regular lighting. And this looks like a, you know, fit athletic guy, but certainly doesn't look anywhere close to what you see here. And, you know, a lot of fucking idiots who don't understand how the fitness industry works would literally see this picture and say he's on steroids and then see this picture and say he's not on steroids. And they must be, you know, significantly far apart timeline wise when obviously it's not the case whatsoever so anyways if you go back and look at him over the years we can kind of get a gauge of where he's at we're going to look at his weight his height um what a body composition he's holding the likelihood is of him being natural with that body composition weight um lean muscle mass on his frame and then we're going to get into some of the drug testing parameters that he's going to be dealing with and what he could be taking to skirt around them and if I think he is, you know, what he could be doing, etc. So anyways, getting into uh, what he looks like now, again, different angles. He looks a lot more reasonable. Like this is the exact same day sitting down as the day where the shot came out where everyone was like, holy shit, drug test him. This guy's on goddamn steroids. This is the exact same day. Here he is standing up. I think this turned into like a meme. Like this picture was photoshopped like a billion fucking ways over the you know, past year. And again, though, lighting plays a huge role. Flexing plays a huge role. Body fat percent plays a huge role. Pump plays a huge role. You all, most people know that who are, you know, regulars on the channel. If you're new to the channel, if you're getting into <laughs> and analyzing, you know, before and afters or even seeing your own physique as you make drastic changes over however many years of uh, bodybuilding and whatnot, you'll quickly notice that you can go from this to this in a matter of two seconds like it's a big fucking difference and you can look night and day different to the point where you're nearly unrecognizable it looks like you've gained 15 pounds of muscle in a matter of two fucking seconds here he is standing uh after losing the ksi looking pretty fucking saucy still here here he is standing at the front looking a bit more natural like again the thing can change in a matter of fucking seconds depending on what you're doing here he is standing here looking very natural then here he is flexing looking goddamn saucy so anyways looking forward to uh or looking back i should say to some of his old physique shots like has he always looked like this did he suddenly blow up one day or what's his progression been like has it looked reasonably natural this was him back in 2015 a really old tweet that uh showed him getting to basically you know, peak leanness for what I assume to be a role. He used to act in uh, movies and TV shows and shit. And um, there was one where he got, I think it was called the, Th the Thinning. It was a movie where he got like ridiculously fucking lean. But self-admittedly, he said his diet model for the movie, he had no idea what he was doing. He was just essentially starving himself. 
And this was the end result, the 182 you see here. And he says it took place in 12 hours where he rebounded back to 196, which is a very common occurrence for guys who drive themselves into the ground with overly aggressive dieting and don't really know what they're doing. But at the end of the day, you can see here in like the most malnourished, depleted, like shitty state ever, five years ago or six years ago at this point, um, or almost that when he's, uh, you know, not even training to be, you know, a professional athlete, he already looked like this with like shitty diet practices. This was him at 182, severely depleted, looking pretty solid. Like when you actually see what that looked like, the end result was this. Yeah. Like it's a pretty fucking mean 182, obviously. And, uh, in the role, he ended up looking like like this he still has a lot of mass in his chest a lot of uh you know like overall size he held reasonably well you know he still looks fucking jacked despite the fact that he literally just essentially starved himself down to 182 and then you know rebounded back to 196 pretty quickly and his walking around weight that he's comfortable at is purportedly 205 if you go look at some of his uh more recent before and afters that he's posted himself. And this was in, uh, I believe, 2018. Given the old gun show fucking flexaroo, here he is. And he has, uh, I believe, a 17-inch arm. You know, it was done in like a vlog that I saw in passing when I was pulling up all the images for this video. And, um, you know, was that a fucking insane measurement as a natural who is a guy who's six foot two and over 200 pounds? No, you know, I think that's somewhat reasonable. But anyways, keep going here. Um, this is him at 180 pounds. So I guess he, you know, depleted fully down to 180 or, you know, he's just saying 180 here when he was 182. And this is like his most malnourished state, presumably the same as here. I'm assuming this was the same time. I don't really know for sure, but I'm pretty sure he only the, did this one time. Not that he's only dieted one time, but the only time he's really like driven himself into the fucking ground to get as goddamn malnourished as possible and obviously the goal wasn't malnourishment but he just had no other way to know what he was doing really this is a more recent shot where he did a weigh-in at 189 um and then here he is you know back up glycogen loaded spilled over a little bit well not spilled but you know what i mean just not nearly as cut up as he is at 189 at 205 and this is his according to him my natural weight healthier and happier than i've been in my life and this is very recent. So anyways, this is kind of like what he walks around at is 205. At six foot two purportedly is what his height is at. And he was actually in this uh, interview with Brendan Schaub, not, you know, I guess like half a year ago at this point, but this was when he was starting to, you know, prepare for Floyd Mayweather. He was already in uh, training at this point. Um, the thought at the time was that the fight was going to occur in February. And obviously it got delayed pretty significantly. So he's basically been training for, you know, a fucking while now. And they go over his, uh, his weight and how much muscle he's holding in this video specifically. Well, that's the thing, right? The greatest boxer of all time faces like the young, uh, behemoth. Yes. Like I'm bro, I'm, I'm going in there and I'm towering over this, this dude. And that's what makes it exciting. It's David versus Goliath. Yes. So if they make me cut to a weight that bro, I'm 200 right now with 9% body fat. Like I've never been good at cutting weight. It kills me. No, it'd be a nightmare. Yeah. They, those terms would have to be agreed to. Yeah. I mean, when you guys sign this contract, yeah, yeah, yeah. that'd be ridiculous. You never know, though. Um, the 200 pounds at 9% body fat back in December. So, if you go back to his physique in December, we can see that again, different angles looks a lot more natural in different angles. But he actually has good <laughs> muscle insertions to the point where he looks a lot bigger than most guys would at that same body composition. Um, so anyways, going back to, this is November 28th. This is pretty much as close as we're going to get as far as I know for a shirtless, you know, mid session, you know, with blood fucking maxed out hyperemia and like ready to go in a fucking picture to look as saucy as possible. And again, does he look that much different in November 28th than he does now? No, like this is pretty much the same thing. Maybe he's a little bit leaner now cause he's peaking, but this is like, honestly, He's basically the same, you know? Like he hasn't really changed a whole lot. Maybe a little bit, maybe he's gained a few pounds of muscle since then, but mostly it's just, he's been dialed in for a while now and he's basically looked the same for 
several, several months at this point, um, going as far back, like February 14th, again, going back to November, not a whole lot different. So he's been around, you know, 200 to 205, 9% body fat, you know, at the 200 mark for this entire, you know, half year. So that number specifically, that body composition, don't worry, we're going to be getting into the drug parameters soon, but just to give a reference, a gauge of if this is reasonable, it's probably easy to look at some of the, you know, natural guys in the fitness industry and get a sort of perspective on what different heights at different body fat percentages look like with guys with, you know, like similar structure, I guess. So one guy that came to mind that I thought was a good example um, to bring up here is Greg O'Gallagher. So I looked up his height and I got like all over the fucking map of what his height supposedly is with all kinds of stats that seem totally incorrect. Like the first result is he's 34 years old and five foot eight, which I'm pretty sure both of those are quite incorrect. But anyways, fortunately he goes over his stats quite a bit on his own Instagram and his height, you know, I wasn't really sure what his height was. So I wanted to look at that in perspective too. And the reason I'm looking at Greg specifically is because he is like one of the most like notable natties in the industry. This guy has basically worked out religiously for the past you know 10 plus years strictly focusing on maximizing hypertrophy and performance like the guy is an absolute like physical representation of just like you know <laughs> fucking dieting and training like that's what he is and he is like a very he's very prominently you know talked about his natural status over the years too and when you look at his numbers, it's not too hard to believe and wrap your head around. Like some of these shots like this one here looks pretty unnatty. He's got the cap delts. He's looking, looking fucking dialed in. He's got the sex lines off the goddamn chin. But when you look at him just like walking around in a t-shirt and whatnot, it's not too, uh, you know, hard to believe that the guy is actually just a athletic lean fucking guy, you know, who has very good insertions and looks exceptional when he's dialed in. And obviously, you know, he's put in a shit ton of work to look like this. So anyways, this is again, like peak form with peak, you know, everything for him. And his weight is about 180 pounds. Now, as far as his height, I'm not sure what he claims it is. I went and looked at uh, some of the pictures he took with Will Tennyson as a kind of uh, gauge to kind of see, you know, what, what he's at. So Will is um, six feet tall, at least according to himself. And, uh, you know, he's posted quite a few pictures before and talked about his stats too. He says he's six feet tall. This was the leanest he's ever been in 2020, February 26th. 175 pounds. Will is another guy who is natural. Um, you know, obviously that's, you know, arguable in the community, but, you know, I think it's pretty well accepted that he is a natural guy just like Greg is. And Greg actually has more impressive body composition numbers if you actually look at sheer weight to height ratio when you think about it. So he's six feet tall. When you look at him standing beside Greg, you know, he's probably got a solid two inches on him, maybe, maybe, you know, one and a half. I don't really know, but let's just say like, you know, conservatively, we have Greg at, um, like, I don't know, like five foot 10 ish. So if you go to the FFMI calculator and you put in five foot 10 inches at 180 pounds at, I don't know what percent body fat he is, but he claims he is typically around like seven to eight as far as I know, unless he's in like peak form. Let's just put like seven here. So like Greg is walking around with the FFMI around 24. Let's just say it's like eight, puts him at, 23 if it was nine that would put him at um let's see so seven was 24 eight was 23.7 nine was 23.5 so it's generally like this is not a scientific way of figuring out or analyzing natural status at all rather we would have elaborate blood work and urine analysis in order to figure that out like with logan paul we would be looking at his uh you know, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry analysis of his urine for, you know, all of the synthetic compounds that you could possibly be using for performance enhancement, including all these synthetic anabolic agents, all of the different stimulants, all of the different metabolic modulators that are included in WADA's banned substance list, and then looking at the blood work for the biological passport to assess any 
aberrations in his hematology to check for blood transfusions, looking for, at his steroidal module for any aberrations in endogenous steroid ratios to assess for bioidentical hormone manipulation, shit like that. Um, but this is kind of like the framework for if we get a gauge of if the guy is even in natural territory, really. Because once you get to over the 25 FFMI, that's kind of like the generally accepted range where things start to get a bit highly likely to be unnatural. And again, this is just a tool to use as a reference point. It's not the gold standard at all. Obviously, the urine analysis and the blood test analysis using actual highly sensitive testing and knowing what to look for specifically and doing it frequently enough and as randomized as possible is the way to do it. But again, none of these leagues have the budget to accommodate that, which will be, we will be getting into shortly. So anyways, Logan Paul at six foot two, 200 pounds, 9% body fat. So one thing Arnold is quoted as saying, or at least, you know, I, I might be paraphrasing and I've mentioned this many times before, is he says that for every inch in height you have, it is the equivalent of another seven pounds on the scale for a proportional increase in, you know, keep maintaining the same body fat percentage for that proportional increase in size. If that makes any sense whatsoever, <laughs> what I'm trying to say, like basically the same equivalent proportions for a six foot two guy versus a five foot 10 guy, it's seven pounds per additional inch proportionally. So for Logan Paul being six foot two, that would be another 28 pounds of leeway he would have on top of Greg O'Gallagher, assuming, you know, let's just say Greg was 189%, which might be, you know, selling him, selling him a bit short. Well, let's just say it was roughly, you know, 189%. So looking at Logan Paul, 200 at 9%, is that reasonable given he is six foot two? Greg's around five foot 10, maybe five foot 11. So we have maybe, you know, 21 to 28 pounds of leeway here. So if we add 21 pounds to 180, where are we at? We're at 201. If we add 28, we are at 208. So Logan being at 200 pounds, 9% body fat, assuming he's even 9% again, you know, he could just be saying that he doesn't fucking know, you know, we've seen how off celebrities are with their body fat percentage gauges. But anyways, let's just give him the benefit of the doubt and say roughly he's that. I would say if you look at his uh, body composition, you can probably say he's at least like probably striking distance, single digits. So anyways, let's just say he's around that. And is that reasonable? You know, if we give him the, you know, 21 to 28 pounds of leeway, like you're above Logan Paul proportionally. So yeah, I think that's fairly reasonable. And the same thing for uh, if you look at his FFMI, when you plug that in, you go down. We're at 23.36. So, you know, it's very, very good. You know, it's quite genetically blessed, but it's not in the realm of, holy fuck, red flag city, this guy is definitely unnatural, you know? So that is that, the FFMI. Getting into the actual drug test. Now, a lot of people don't even know, is this even drug tested? Can you just use whatever the fuck you want? Because it's, at the end of the day, kind of a... I don't know, exhibition, if you will. It's not like some professional, like high tier league of fighting for a, you know, like a world championship belt or some shit. Rather, it's just two guys putting on an event, fighting a few rounds and, you know, trying to make a fuck ton of money. Is there even drug testing involved? Turns out there is reasonably elaborate drug testing involved, or at least enough to catch a guy who has got out around testing in the past many times. John Pascal ended up testing positive for epitrenbolone, drostanolone, also known as Masteron, and a Masteron metabolite. So uh, when you're test, obviously epitrenbolone, we're looking at things that are found in his urine analysis that are either the parent compound or metabolites of it. And the fact that he had not only parent compound, but metabolites in the system of Masteron, you know, this guy's not being very careful at all. Like this guy's being a fucking idiot with what he's taking. And it's kind of interesting because apparently this guy has historically been, you know, very, very sus about being not natty and cheating. You know, people have called him out many times. He's gotten away with it. He's always, you know, tested clean, presumably. He's never had a problem, never had a blemish on his record as far as I know. And now he's testing positive as a, uh, he's on the undercard for Mayweather Paul. So he is indeed out 
Um, and now it's Friday night that on Twitter that Pascal tested positive for three steroids has been removed from their light heavyweight championship rematch, which was scheduled for June 6th. The second bout between Pascal and Jack was supposed to be a Showtime pay-per-views co-feature before the Floyd Mayweather Logan Paul exhibition at Hard Rock Stadium, Miami Gardens, Florida. My fight is off as he tested positive for three different steroids. We suspected he was dirty the first time around. And Vada testing confirmed it this time. I'm still fighting on June 6th, and my team is looking for a replacement opponent. So, anyways, the guy tests positive for three things you should not have in your system as a professional boxer. Fucking idiotic things to test positive for, frankly, when you are a guy who uh, knows there will be randomized testing. Like, you would not put yourself into a testing pool and try to get away with something like fucking Trendblown, dude. Like, a 19 nor in general is going to be so goddamn detectable, the fact that you thought you could clear it out of your system in time is baffling. Of course, you know, you could have thought you were getting something else. I think something that often probably does happen is guys employing somebody to create a designer drug and ending up with things that are actually very detectable at the end of the day. Because indeed, there are still people trying to design designer drugs and get around these tests with compounds that are either uh you know resurrected from f old pharmaceutical pipelines and created with uh you know analogs of them or structurally modified you know in minor ways to kind of skirt around testing parameters and whatnot because frankly if wada does not have any historical data on a compound it's not going to be able to test for it so i suspect that a lot of these times these guys are either like you could either be an idiot or using compounds that are highly detectable and obvious synthetics or you could be trying to design a compound that's undetectable and you know getting it delivered to you and you take it and it ends up being detectable as fuck because it's ridden with some of the you know or it is just you know pure like parent hormone of something that you were trying to tweak and modify but it ends up you know your chemist fucking fails you and you end up with some normal ass ugl shit and you end up with fucking trend or mastron or something and then you test positive for it so anyways this guy tested hot for things that you should not test hot for and things you shouldn't even be using as a boxer subject to randomized testing but when it comes to paul mayweather what could paul be doing you know clearly he has presumably passed tests with flying colors so far he has been randomly selected how many times i imagine fairly infrequently i'm sure that this uh is not the most strict you know i'm sure it's not as uh stringent as something like the ufc however i'm sure the undercard has a positive test result you know like weeks before the event like obviously if this was you know, they were trying to make this as easy on everyone as possible. You would not have guys testing positive a couple weeks before and making people scramble to coordinate getting a replacement. Like, that does not help anyone to have somebody test positive right now. So, you know, obviously, like, it's taken, like, relatively serious. Now, as far as, again, getting into what Paul could be doing, do I think he's taking anabolic steroids? No, I don't. I think he's a very genetically blessed individual who holds a lot of mass naturally, and I don't think he really gains a lot by adding AAS on top of his regimen. You know, perhaps you can make an argument for bioidentical T, um, given the elevated, you know, hematology or certain other things. But is it really worth the ROI for him when he is already so much bigger than his opponent? And any more additional muscle tissue, to be honest, is not really helping him at this time. I don't think he's on any anabolic steroids. I think that would be any of these synthetics, like fucking Trenbolone and Masteron, terrible choices. Bioidentical T would be something that would be logically chosen. However, well, certain, you know, a variant of bioidentical T, not just straight up commercial grade. But in Paul's case, given his body composition, his historical body composition, I should say as well, I don't think he benefits a lot from using it. So no, I don't think he's using any steroids. I do think he's natty in that regard when it comes to anabolics. However, when it comes to other metabolic modulators and endurance aids and whatnot, is there anything on the table that he could be leveraging that would make sense? Well, obviously from a cognitive aspect, as a guy who's fairly new to boxing, you know, he has a couple of years under his belt at this point, but to enhance stuff like motor learning, motor unit recruitment, things of this nature, I believe he's probably using shit that's allowed, to be honest. Like there's a lot of stuff that is allowed that is actually fairly helpful in the nootropic space. Things like Slank, things like um, Alpha GPC, um, things that are going to enhance skill acquisition, learning, and motor unit recruitment to end up being a more effective fighter and a uh, 
expedite the uh, learning process to get better as quickly as goddamn possible and maximize the efficacy of your training sessions and whatnot. So I imagine that is, you know, there's a lot of different compounds you can be leveraging in that aspect. And I've detailed some of that stuff in my nootropic videos. Um, there are a lot of other like, you know, random chems that are interesting applications for that purpose. You know, even insulin in small dosages, L-carnitine, um, I mentioned Solanc. There's a lot of other shit that is kind of like under the radar that could be useful for people, even if they're trying to avert testing. These kind of things are, uh, you know, still options on the table. Um, as far as the actual endocrine parameter side of things though, and hematology and whatnot, you know, what could he be doing? What is actually useful from like a traditional PED aspect? And like, again, that's a sweeping overview of the cognitive component. I'm sure he has a lot going on in that area, or at least he should, if he has, you know, good people in his camp. Now, as far as the actual like performance metrics in a, you know, endurance aspect or something, blood transfusions, you know, are you going to get away with uh, significant aberrations in your hematology profile via the biological passport? Well, frankly, I don't even know if there is a biological passport. I don't know if they're using that many resources to assess these guys. Obviously, they're doing basic testing with GCMS via urine, like this uh, John Pascal guy who got popped. But that's for urine analysis that's basic as fuck. And people even at uh, like natural bodybuilding shows are employing that kind of testing. Like that's how rudimentary it is. So is somebody like the, uh, you know, the is Vada employing biological passport analysis, you know, throughout this uh, preparation process? Well, I guess it depends on the resources that were allocated during this event, which is largely on Paul and Mayweather and whoever the uh, big heads are at work for coordinating this thing and how stringent they wanted it. Cause at the end of the day, that is largely a self-funded thing when you're getting into how randomized it is, how elaborate it is. Cause at the end of the day, you might just want the appearance of testing. Oh yeah, we're drug testing everyone. When in reality, you're just doing very basic, you know, testosterone to epitestosterone ratios, GCMS testing for synthetic anabolic steroids, testing for, you know, rec drugs or some shit. Like stuff like that is very, very basic and is not all encompassing, especially for things like growth hormone, things like EPO, things of this nature are not going to be detectable easily, even with full blown bulletproof testing in places like the UFC. So when it comes to this, what could Logan be doing? You know, the most logical thing obviously would be enhancing your endurance through manipulating your hematology. So that would involve blood transfusions potentially, probably using his own blood, I would assume. And then as well as looking at something like EPO, that would be a very, very obvious go-to for somebody as a boxer. And I would not be surprised if that is something potentially being looked at at his camp. And I would imagine it would be definitely looked at if the testing did not involve a very, very stringent hematology profile analysis with longitudinal marker analysis. Now, again, Logan has never really fucking competed in elaborately tested events. The guy is like brand new to boxing. So how much longitudinal data does he actually have to analyze these aberrations? Almost fucking none. So the guy has a significant amount of leeway within this, you know, steroidal module. Well, not the steroidal module within the um, biological passport in his hematology profile for fuckery if you wanted to use blood transfusions if you wanted to use epo this is the kind of shit you can get away with fairly fairly easily if you don't have a bunch of background data that shows like even a minuscule aberration would trigger a red flag because frankly there's not enough data to develop this very very narrow window of what is normal for you so for him he has this wide fucking variation that he has a lot of leeway to fuck with if he really wanted to. And even when it comes down to elaborate testing at the UFC level, there is no subsequent EPO testing unless you have a red flag via an aberration in your biological passport. So it's not like the likelihood is even high. You're going to get tested for EPO to begin with. Like you need a reason to test these guys, to actually spend the money to do this elaborate next level analysis testing. So the likelihood you're even going to get tested for EPO off the bat is like fucking none unless you significantly fuck up. And that's even with the longitudinal data. So with him, with none of that data, with none of that shit banked up, I would not be surprised if something like EPO were definitely discussed at one point especially given him gassing the fuck out in the KSI fights. Like that is his obvious biggest detriment is gassing out. So why would you not be looking at that? Like to me, that is what I think he would be doing. I don't think he's doing anabolic steroids. I think he'd be looking at the cognitive aspect 
and the endurance aspect most. So let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that analysis. Like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplacemoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram at moreplacemoredates, Facebook, Snapchat, BitChute, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below my TRT clinic. It's all telemedicine from the Come For Your Own Home. We have the best doctors and patient care coordinators available in the country that I've vetted myself personally and reflect the same quality of information I put out on my channel. And you can get my recommended lab tests and diagnostics done through the links in the video description as well and have them analyzed by those doctors and have their personal recommendations for you uh, and protocols designed accordingly if warranted. And all medications are shipped right to your door. It's all telemedicine. Again, like I said, Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, whatever is convenient for you. Don't even need to leave your fucking house. It's the way of the future, in my opinion. And telemedicine is definitely a booming industry right now. And I'm very, very grateful to be able to bring services like this to you. And what else? Uh, Gorilla Mind Nootropic Formulas. I talked briefly about nootropics in this video. Definitely check out Gorilla Mind Smooth if you haven't. It's uh, a very, very potent formula I designed myself. Um, based on cholinergics and things that are going to enhance motor unit recruitment like I discussed briefly. But anything else I'm associated with, it's all in the video description below. If you want to subscribe and see some of my more elaborate deep dives into pharmacology in both a you know bodybuilding aspect, performance enhancement aspect, sports, you know, in professional sports aspects, hit the subscribe button. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.